I'm Sid Colpass, Assistant Professor of Mathematics at DCCC, and the title of my talk, Lewis Carroll, His Works as a Fantasy Author and as a Mathematician. So why I decided to spend my entire life, this is my 43rd year of teaching, full-time, no break, teaching mathematics. I was fascinated with math and very early on, elementary school was very good at it. Friends and fellow students always told me that I explained math better than their teachers when they asked me for help. I felt great joy in explaining difficult mathematical concepts to others. It was challenging and rewarding. I found teaching highly rewarding not in the monetary sense. Interesting and challenging. Students are challenging. I love lifelong learning, and if you want to stay vital in the art of teaching, you keep on learning. You're always a student. And I had a number of individuals who got me interested in math and encouraged me along the way. There are always those pivotal people that they could what? Discourage you from ever pursuing your dream or encouraging you. And there were very important people in my life without whom I might have gone in a different direction. So Alan Mescon, my ninth grade algebra teacher, he lives near San Diego now in a retirement community. He's in his late 80s and we're Facebook friends and just survived open heart surgery. I'll never forget him, my ninth grade algebra teacher. Dr. Malcolm Sewell, a CSUN professor, Cal State University Northridge, equivalent to Westchester here, with whom I had four classes. Why did I keep taking classes with him? Not because he was easy, because he was an amazingly good teacher, challenging but very fair. And we've been friends for over 49 years now. I kind of miss him because we often went out to lunch back in LA, but he's in Los Angeles and I'm here. And he's the one on the far right in the suit. Martin Gardner, he was my hero growing up. I read so many of his books and followed his column in Scientific American. He wrote a mathematics column in Scientific American for many years. And I read everything he wrote, and I corresponded with him, and I have a packet of letters. He died just a few years ago. Um, and what was amazing, he was my hero, and about 15 years ago, in two books he published, he quoted me. My hero quoted me. So that was kind of cool. And that's Martin Gardner later in life, died a few years ago. And Dr. Barnabas Hughes, anyone know what OFM means? Order of Franciscan Monks. One of my best friends and most significant professors, a priest, Father Dr. Hughes, PhD and Catholic priest. He was a professor, was, still is, but he's 3,000 miles away, a mentor and a friend. We used to meet once a month for lunch on a Saturday morning. Can't do that anymore. He sparked an interest in mathematics in me. I had him for five classes. And he served as spiritual guidance as well when I needed it. Double row, mathematics history, and teaching. But I'd like to dedicate this talk to Martin Gardner, who inspired me early when I was still in elementary school reading some of his works. So Charles Ludwig Dodgson, that's Lewis Carroll's real name. He was born January 27, 1832, early Victorian England, and died January 14, 1898. See, he almost lived to age 66. My God, that's how old I am, 66 going on 67. He died of pneumonia, but they didn't have anti biotics then, because I've had bronchial pneumonia and, you know, tetracycline or amoxicillin, and I'm better. But he died of pneumonia, something that these days he could have been cured of. Charles Ludwig Dodgson, 
Charles Lutwidge, first name, middle name, Lutwidge, his mother's maiden name, Dachshund, his father's name. So he took Charles Lutwidge. He Latinized it to Carolus Levoticus, which then morphed back to what? Lewis Carol, which he chose as his pen name, Gnome de Plume. So Charles Dodgson was a mathematician, a renowned, esteemed, loved by his students, Oxford mathematician. And his alter ego, Lewis Carroll, was a children's author. Alice in Wonderland, there's a Disneyland ride, Disney World ride, Alice in Wonderland, and through the looking glass amongst other fantasy works. Oh, and let me back up. There's a common theme. There's the white albet, rabbit in Alice in Wonderland, and he's always worrying about what? Time. Time is a theme in Lewis Carroll's works. So there's the rabbit. I'm late, I'm late for a very important date. So, um, Carol Dachshund timeline, just to give you an overview. This was a very complex, interesting man, so it's just an overview. My goal is to whet your interest, so you'll want to read more. In 1854, he got his Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics at Oxford, and he was first in mathematics. There was an exit exam called the Tripos, basically mathematics, liter literature, and classics, Greek and Latin classics. He scored first in his graduating class in mathematics, exit exam, sort of like an SAT, and second in classics. Wow, out of the entire graduating class of Oxford University. In 1857, he got a Master of Arts in Mathematics at Oxford. Oxford would be comparable to UPenn here in the United States. And he became an Oxford professor. When he got his master's degree, they said, please stay and teach. In 1861, he became an ordained minister. So not only math professor, not only children's author, but minister. He had his own congregation with Sunday sermons, ordained minister. In 1865, he wrote Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and Alice was a real person. More about that later. She ended up dying after marrying Mr. Hargraves, Alice Hargraves. Real person. In 1871, he wrote a follow-up of Alice in Wonderland, Alice Through the Looking Glass, where she chases her cat through a mirror into a mirror world. In 1876, The Hunting of the Snark. 1889, Sylvain and Bruna. There are some title pages. I own most first editions of his works, which my wife keeps threatening to sell when make a down payment on a dream car. So there's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland with illustrations by Sir John Tenniel, title page, first edition, and Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There by Lewis Carroll, Macmillan and Company, 1872. Title pages, I scan them for my collection. Some mathematical tiles as Charles Dodgson, because he was Charles Dodgson, professor, but sometimes also published as Lewis Carroll. Matrices and determinants. Linear algebra, math 200 at DCCC. And I have an article about his works in matrices and determinants. Come up and take one if you're well versed in linear algebra. That's why I didn't hand it out. That would be Math 200 at DCCC. He taught linear algebra, Math 200 here, at Oxford University. Euclid and his Modern Rivals, a book on geometry, normally taught in high school, high school geometry, but it was more than it. It was non-Euclidean geometry that ultimately led to Einstein's theory of relativity, but Dodgson never lived to find that out. 
he did work in non-Euclidean geometry. I do not own a first edition of it, but I've got a modern copy of it. Euclid and his modern rivals. A discussion of how geometry was changing to non-Euclidean geometry. But I do have a first edition by C.L. Dodgson, Charles Lutwidge Dodgson, a new theory of parallels. If you carry, change the parallel postulate in geometry, you get non-Euclidean geometry. And he was working on it, never knowing that some 30, 40 years later, Einstein would use it. Really critical in Einstein's theory of relativity. Kind of interesting. He did work on symbolic logic. That's chapter 3 in Math 120, and I own a first edition. It's worth over $2,000 first edition, and he turned it into a game. He was a very innovative math professor. He tried to teach dis difficult concepts with tricks, puzzles, games, to make it more interesting to his students. And I even have the game card that came with it, with the game pieces. Not many of these survived because they were used at Oxford to teach symbolic logic. So he was on the cutting edge of symbolic logic that ultimately led to computer science. So here's the first edition of it. And we teach that in chapter three in Math 120. I spend three weeks on it. And the book we use here in Math 120 actually mentions Lewis Carroll. Um, mathematical theory of voting, he did game theory. That would mas be master's degree level work a mathematical theory of voting, which revolutionized voting procedures in England and Great Britain. People actually read it, very serious work. <coughs> a Tangled Tale is a book of puzzles. That's Math 120, Chapter 1. All sorts of logical reasoning puzzles and problem-solving puzzles. Pillow Problems, Puzzles, Chapter 1, Math 120. Curiosa Mathematica Puzzles, Chapter 1, Math 120. I didn't bring that. Plain al Algebraic Geometry, that's College Algebra, Math 151, Analytic Geometry. Equations of Parabolas, Circles, etc. <coughs> math 151. And a new theory of parallels, I showed you that book, his work in non-Euclidean geometry. And that's just a taste of what he did. He was a serious, accomplished mathematician. And there's the game of logic. I'd rather not pass it around. This is a very rare book, so I scanned it. And there are some of the puzzle pieces and the game board, and it's this book. Not many copies survived. They were heavily used in symbolic logic classes at Oxford. And on the right, that's his work in linear algebra, math 200 here. And here's a complete explanation how, how he did matrices and determinants. Please take one if you're well versed in math 200 or higher. I've got copies for my colleagues. Or anyone who's interested, but you would have had to have mastered math 200. So that's linear algebra and matrices and determinants. And there's the title page of Euclid and his modern rivals. I don't own a first edition of it, rather pricey and rare, but that's what the title page looks like. Some inventions mostly used to teach. He was into teaching toys. So mechanical toys to teach mathematical concepts. Mathematical magic tricks, I'll teach you a few. Cool, you can amaze your friends after this talk. And they might be applicable to some of my math colleagues in their classes. You might want to use these in your classes. He made games like a traveling chessboard and the game of doublets. And here's a first edition of doublets. I'm going to teach you how to play doublets. I used it when I taught high school geometry as an introduction to proof, to mathematical proof. That was his purpose. Uh, Sigid G's, circular billiards. 
I made a circular, actually an elliptical pool table, and you can't miss a shot. If you shoot through one focus, an ellipse has two foci, it always goes into the hole in the other focus, even if you were blind. <laughs> and he used that to teach the properties of ellipses while having his students play the elliptical pool. I mean, very creative teacher. And special photographic effects, he was a premier Victorian photographer, and I'll show you some of his photographs. He was a, so we're talking about what? Children's author, reverend, mathematician, and accomplished photographer. And there's the, the book of doublets. All I did was put that in my scanner to show you the, the cover. You'll get an idea of what doublets is like. So doublets, he also called word ladders, is a game invented for two little girls who found nothing to do on Christmas Day, 1877. Guess who one of the girls was? Alice. You'll learn more about Alice. You might even want to research her. Carroll originally called the game Word Links, but by 1879, he had published so many of these doublet puzzles that it got picked up by the magazine Vanity Fair in 1879. Is Vanity Fair still published? Yeah. yeah. It's a very famous magazine, both in England and the United States, like Mademoiselle, Glamour, Vogue, Vanity Fair. And titled it Doublets, a word puzzle. The name stuck, and the game was a runaway hit in England almost like a ah, senior moment, the number puzzles. Sudoku, just like Sudoku today. So here's an example of doublets. You start with a word, we're starting with what? DNA. And I want to turn DNA, dioxyribonucleic acid, into God. The rules of doublets is whatever you start with, you can only change one letter at a time, and it still has to spell a legitimate word or acronym. So let's look at it. DNA, he changed the N to an I, right? It spells dia. I know that's Spanish, it means day, but it's still a legitimate word. Then from dia, we change the A to G, so it spells dig. Is it still a legitimate word? From dig, we go to what? Dog, we change the I to an O. It's still a legitimate word. You can only change one letter at a time. From dog, we go to what? Nog, like eggnog. Okay? Nog is still a word in the English dictionary. From nog, we go to what? Nod, I change the G to a D. It's still a word. And from nod, we make it to what? God, so we've established that DNA is God's code. Ooh. Okay? So, you're gonna play the game with me now. I wanna change a dog into a cat. Alchemy, okay? So dog, change one letter, please. It's gotta still spell a word, we've gotta make it to cat. G to T. So, dog becomes dot. I'll say something about this when we're done. So, we changed one letter, it's still a word, dot. Now what? D to C. D to C. Dot becomes cot. And now what? Cat. So, have we changed the dog into a cat? Pretty amazing, huh? I used to use this in junior high school when I taught junior high school, elementary school, and even high school, and occasionally even in college, because there's more than one way to get from start to finish. It requires creativity, you've got to play by the rules, and it's what proof is like in geometry and mathematics, one step at a time, but there's more than one path to the truth, to the answer. Get it? Now here's a harder one, and I'd like more participation. 
I want you to change head to tail. So, first step. Fred. D to an L. Head becomes heel. And sometimes we need to heal ourselves. Next. Not just Fred, please. Someone else? H to a T. Teal. Isn't that a color? Yes. You can always have a dictionary in front of you, as they did in Victorian England playing this. Yes, spell checkers. All right, we have spell checkers, but they didn't back in Victorian England. Next. You want to change head to tail. Huh? A to an L. Tell. Tell. Right? And now what? Tall. I'm sorry, E to an A. Tall. We've only changed one letter at a time, and it's still got to spell a word. Mike? And now what? Tail. 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 I ask my students, is this the only way to do it? No. Obviously not. There's more than one path to the truth. It takes creativity, but you've got to follow the laws, the rules. Questions on that? And here's a whole book of them. Some of them, if you take a look at the solutions in the back, take 30 steps. I just gave you a taste of them, but it has use in mathematics teaching. So some characteristics and accomplishments, to, just to give you a taste of what the man was like. One of the top Victorian photographers, you'll see some of his pictures later. A minister. One of his sermons, one of his sermons to his congregation, Sunday sermon, was on animal rights that how we treat animals reflects how we treat one another. He was an anti-vivisectionist. He was very much against using animals in research. He thought it was cruel and wrote articles about it. He not only wrote math books and fantasy works, but articles speaking out against what? Voting abuse? That's a topic in Pennsylvania. And spoke out against animal abuse. He was deeply religious. He was a minister in the Church of Christ. He was an anti-vivisectionist. He helped to form an animals' right, rights league in England, which would be the equivalent of what here? ASPCA, Society for the, um, American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. He stammered when he spoke. He had a lifelong stuttering problem, and there were no speech therapists then, like the King's Speech. Remember the movie? This was England. So when he pronounced his name, which was Dodgson, he said, do, do Dodgson, and people laughed at him because it sounded like he was calling himself a lot. Dodo. <coughs> that will be significant in Alice in Wonderland and Alice in particular. Do, do, Dodson, Dodo, the Dodo. He was a literary critic, so he wrote book reviews for the London Times. Book reviews, poetry, political commentary. In a way, he was kind of the John Stewart or Stephen Colbert of his time, but there was no TV. He was a political humorist a poet, an amazing poet. I'll share one of his poems with you. Sometimes brings tears to my eyes. It's absolutely beautiful. And he spent most of his time babysitting, his spare time. Remember, he was an Oxford professor, but he had to get what? Tenure. And to get tenure, you'll do almost anything. And the dean, like Dean Agar here, was Dean Liddell. So when Dean Dillette, Liddell, the Dean of STEM, 
there was technology then, science, technology, engineering, math. When Dean Liddell said, sit my daughters, he sat his daughters, got it? Didn't want to rub the dean the wrong way. And one of Dean Liddell's daughters was named Alice, Alice Pleasant Liddell. So he spent most of his spare time babysitting Dean Liddell's children, and Alice Liddell was his favorite. You know, as a grandfather, I try not to play favorites, but we all do anyway, right? And Alice was his favorite. And to entertain her, he started making up stories about her following a white rabbit down a hole. Get it? Just to entertain her, keep her quiet. There's Alice, the real Alice, and guess who took the photograph? Lewis Carroll, Charles Dodson. There's Alice. And there's um, Charles Dodson with the Liddell children. He might have set it on a timer if there was such a thing and then ran back into the photo or maybe made a, asked a friend to take it. There's the Liddell children, the mean-looking Mrs. Liddell, the dean's wife. And I guess she cut out afterward and said, you watch them. After all, you want to get tenure, don't you? Okay? So there's Charles and Alice. Charles Ludwig Dodson. Oh, and there's Alice, as a matter of fact, on the right as a young woman. She was no longer Alice Pleasance Liddell. She had married a Mr. Hargraves, and she was Alice Hargraves. Alice comforts the dodo. When he was babysit babysitting them, occasionally people would say, who are you? I'm Char Charles what? Do, do, Dodson. And people would laugh at him, and Alice would always come to his rescue. Don't make fun of my friend. Alice comforts the dodo, but that's from Alice in Wonderland. There are all sorts of literary, literary political, social, philosophical, and mathematical allusions buried in Alice in Wonderland. It can be read from many different eyes. It is not just a children's story. He's making fun of British representatives, prime ministers, uh, making social commentary, thanking Alice for what? Coming to his rescue when made, people make fun of his stammering, his stuttering. There are mathematical puzzles and symbolic logic hidden in the book. They can be read at many, many, many different levels. There are even theology in the book, religious commentary. So there's Alex comforting the dodo. There's the dodo bird representing who? Dodgson himself. Alice did comfort him. And here's title page of Alice in Wonderland, the later edition, with the real Alice instead of a caricature by Sir John Tenniel. And here's a poem from Through the Looking Glass, the follow-up to Alice in Wonderland. Gives you a taste of his poetry. A boat beneath the sunning sky, lingering onward dreamily, in an evening of July. Guess when he started making up Alice in Wonderland? An evening in July when he had to babysit the kids and they went on a row, uh, they went on the river in a rowboat. Children three, how many baby, uh, how many Liddell children was he watching? Three. Children three that nestle ear, near, eager eye and willing ear, pleased a simple tale to hear. What tale is he making up? Alice in Wonderland, to entertain in particular, Alice, the most rowdy of the girls. Long has paled that sunny sky, echoes fade and memories die, autumn frosts have slain July. Still she haunts me, phantom wise, Alice moving under skies, never seen by waking eyes. Children yet the tale to hear, eager eye and willing ear, lovingly shall nestle near. In a wonderland they lie, dreaming as the days go by, 
dreaming as the summers die, ever drifting down the stream, lingering in the golden gleam. Life, what is it but a dream? Now, did I bolt the first letter of each sentence? What's buried in that poem? Alice Pleasance Liddell, yeah. dedicated to her. Because Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass is delicate, dedicated to Alice. The little girl that at least appreciated him as a human being and defended him when people made fun of him. Alice Pleasance Liddell. If you read Through the Looking Glass and Alice in Wonderland carefully, there are hidden messages. There's one of them. Good luck finding the others because I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> so Lewis Carroll's calendar magic, he memorized the following trick and computed the day of the week for any date in under 20 seconds. I can't do it. I refuse to memorize it. Oh, and by the way, there's the rabbit again. A common theme in his works is what? time. We're running out of time. And A Day for Any Date was published. He published his trick, which he used to teach algebra. He taught algebra, like Math 60, which then was more of an advanced course. Math 60 here, elementary algebra. And it got published in Nature Magazine. Is Nature Magazine still published today? Oh yeah, very prestigious magazine, on March 31st, 1870, 1887. And it, the trick begins with a quote from Watt through the looking glass, which reminds me of the White Queen said, looking down and nervously clasping and unclasping her hands. We had such a thunderstorm last Tuesday. I mean, it was the last set of Tuesdays, you know. Alice was puzzled. In our country, she remarked, there's only one day at a time. Kind of interesting. That's from Through the Looking Glass. Methods of predicting the day of the week preceded Carroll. For example, Augustus de Morgan, and we teach his works in chapter 2 and 3 in Math 121, published something similar in 1851. But here's finding a day, the separate handout. I redid it yesterday. A separate single page handout. Each month has a number. In leap years divisible by four, use zero for January and three for February. So there are the numbers of the month. I'll go through this with you. Each day has a number. Sunday's one all the way to Saturday is zero. There are the rules. I will go over one example, and there are two fa famous dates from American history. What happened October 19, 1947? These are famous dates in American history. Israel? I don't think so, Jim. Maybe. No one knows what happened October 19, 1947. No, it's after World War II. Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier. sound barrier at noon, October 19th, 1947. But there's another reason it's famous. I was born. <laughs> That's my birthday. The moment I was born, within seconds, Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier. First time someone broke the sound barrier. And I've been doing it ever since. Yeah. And the second one, July 4th, 1776, what happened in Philly? Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence was signed. So let's use that as an example, please. Anyone want to guess what day the Declaration of Independence was signed? Sunday. Sunday sounds good to celebrate the Lord's Day. Friday. Who knows? Let's find out. So we're going to do July 4th, 1776. Take the last two figures of the year. So that's 76. You're welcome to take notes. We good so far? Divide by four, omitting all fractions. So four goes into 76 19 times. If 
there had been a remainder or a fraction, I would have ignored it, okay? We're just going to use the 76, I mean the 19. So I've got 76, I've got 19. Step three, I don't have this memorized. Take the key number of the month, July is what number? Zero. July is zero. That first chart. Mm -hmm. Step four, take the number of the day of the month. It was July 4th, so four. Step five, add your answers to the first four questions. So what's 76, 19, 0, and 4? What do they add to? 99. That's the sum of 76, 19, 0, and 4. Just following the rules. Are we in the 1700s? Yes, yes so I'm going to add what? 4. four. So step six, I'm numbering them. 99 plus 4 is 103. I currently have 103. Just following them step by step. We're not in the 1800s, 2000s, or 2100s. The trick works as early as the 1700s all the way through next century, 2100s. Now divide by what? Seven, so I'm going to divide seven into 103. <coughs> it goes 14 times with a remainder of five. Yeah? And the remainder gives you the day of the week. You can actually use these rules and tell someone what day they were born on if they don't know, or what some date through 2199 will be, what day in the future, or any past historical event back to the 1700s. So what's a five? Thursday. Thursday. And if you read your history books, the Declaration of Independence was <coughs> signed on Thursday. <laughs> July 4th, 1776, it was a Thursday. There is a website. And the escape key is broken, so I can't get to the website. <laughs> I have it queued up, but there's a website. If you type that website in, and if you type in July 4th, 1776, it will hit back immediately. Thursday because this algorithm is programmed in. So play with the website. I have it. Oh, wait, I can do all 10. Of them. And someone closed my Google Chrome. So I'm not going to worry about it. Just go to that website, okay? I had it queued up, someone closed it. All right? You can type in the date, and it works according to this algorithm. Now, another Lewis Carroll trick that's good for elementary algebra. Pick any month from any calendar. You can try this at home in a major family and friends. Box any three by three matrix of dates. So it's got to be three rows, three columns. Any month, any calendar. I'll almost instantly tell you the sum of those. Nine dates, not having seen them before. So isn't it kind of amazing if there are nine numbers up on a board that someone not knowing what they are in advance, can just turn around and in a matter of seconds tell you what they all add to. How did I do it? Well, do I have a calendar here from January 2000? 
And I happen to put on the whiteboard 12, 13, 14, 19, 20, 21, 26, 27, 28. Is that a block of three by three from the calendar? If I had more time, but I was worried about time, like the white rabbit, I would have had someone come up and without my looking do a three by three block, and I would turn around not knowing in advance what you picked, and I would tell you what they all add up to. It's pretty spectacular. And by the way, all of those nine numbers add up to 180. If you add up 12, 13, 14, 19, 20, 21, 26, 27, 28, they add up to 180. Pretend someone picked that block of numbers and I turned around and gave you 180 instantly. Would that be amazing? Because I wouldn't know what those numbers are. Lewis Carroll used this in his algebra classes to get his students excited about <coughs> algebra. And then they wanted to know, how do you do it? How does it work? So here's the explanation. Could this first number have been any number with e reason, within reason from the calendar? Right? X. What would the next number be? X plus 1. 12 plus 1 is 13. And the next number? X plus 2, 12 plus 2 is 14. So far okay? What would be the date below it? X plus 7. Pick any date in the calendar, the same day, one week later, is seven days later, right? I am Lewis Carroll right now, or Charles Dodgson. This is how we explained it. So this would be X plus eight. This would be x plus nine. One more, one more, or seven more going vertically. And what would this date be? Seven more, x plus 14, x plus 15, x plus 16. And the magician turns around and predicts the sum. Well, what is the sum? Wouldn't it be adding these nine algebraic expressions? Well, there are how many x's? Nine. And the numbers 1, 2, 7, 8, 9, 14, 15, and 16 add to 72. So all nine expressions add up to 9x plus 72. And in Lewis Carroll, Charles Dachshund's algebra classes, they were expected to know how to factor. Distributive property, which I teach in Math 120, it shows up all semester. They've got to know the distributive property, even in Math 120. So I can factor out a 9, and that leaves x plus 8, 9x's plus 72. But what is x plus 8? It's the middle number. <coughs> Algebraically, it's the middle number. So all you have to do as a magician is turn around and multiply the middle number by nine in your head. And on a calendar, none of the numbers are going to be that big. It's not that hard to multiply by nine. I picked something easy. The middle number here was what? 20? And nine times 20 is 180. If I would have picked a block, two, three, well, two, three, four, nine, ten, eleven, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, they would have added to ninety. Ten would have been in the middle. Got it? There's the algebraic proof. And he got his students excited about algebra and distributive property, and they could go home in Oxford, England, and do the trick on their friends and make friends think they're amazing, and they can add nine numbers up instantly. Now, Lewis Carroll logic puzzle taken right from Math 120. He was on the cutting edge of symbolic logic, which later led to computer science. 
So here's a puzzle he actually did at Oxford University, right from his Oxford University syllabus. All babies are illogical, except that. That's called the premise. Nobody is despised who can manage a crocodile, and illogical persons are despised. From those three premises, come up with a logical conclusion. And here's how he taught it and how I teach it in Math 120. B is, it's a baby. L, it's logical. M, it can manage a crocodile. D, it is despised. All babies are logical means if you're a baby, <coughs> you're not logical. That's what it means. If B, then not L. If you're a baby, you're not logical. That's the symbolic statement, meaning all babies are illogical. The second statement, nobody is despised who can manage a crocodile. What would that be? If you can manage a crocodile, which is M, <coughs> then you're not despised. If you can manage a crocodile, then you're not despised. M, arrow, not D. You're getting a taste of Math 120, Liberal Arts Math 1, here at DCCC. It's actually in the text. Illogical persons are despised. That means if you're not logical, then you're what? Despised. So symbolically, almost like computer science, there are the three premises. Now you need to come up with a conclusion. Watch this. If B, then not L. If you're a baby, you're not logical. If you're not logical, then you're despised. Am I forming a chain of reasoning? <coughs> But there's something wrong here. I wish this were a what? A D? It turns out in Math 120, in English even it works, if you flip a sentence around and take the negation of both parts, it still means the same thing. It's called contrapositive. If it rains, then I bring my umbrella. If I don't bring my umbrella, then it must not be raining. You can flip a sentence around, negate each part, it still means the same thing. We actually prove that in Math 120 using truth tables. So for this I can substitute D arrow not M. I flipped it around and negated each part. So not D became D, M became not M, and they changed places. So can I complete the chain? So the final conclusion is, if you're a baby, you cannot manage what? Crocodiles, and this would have been on Lewis Carroll's test. You gave, I, it's on my test when I teach Math 120, something similar, I expect them to have mastery of it after I teach the material. So the conclusion is, if you're a baby, you can't manage crocodiles. There's the end, and the Cheshire Cat, you see the Cheshire Cat? Guess what part of England Lewis Carroll lived in? Cheshire, he came from Cheshire, England, Cheshire Cat. So, suggested reading. This is so cool, and it's by my hero, Martin Gardner. It's Alice in Wonderland, but he reveals all the hidden secrets, the hidden math puzzles, the political commentary, trashing the king and queen. He was against royalty. Religious metaphors. Got the idea? <coughs> Symbolic logic. So when you read the book, it's annotated on the side. It, he, he reveals all the secrets by Martin Gardner, my hero. There's another book by Morton Cohen and another one by Robin Wilson, all of which I've read. But I would strongly suggest reading this book if you want to learn more. And that's it. If you 
want to see the original books come on up, I'll handle them. There's a sign in for people who might come in later. Oh, and sign in for people who may have come in later up here.